Okay, uh, just give me a little. Um, welcome to our last video in the Black Shoals series. In the previous video, um, you can kind of see still the see, still see the detritus in my fourth and last video. Um, we finally derived. We didn't really derive. We kind of linked. We, we skipped a lot of the algebra, but um, we we derived uh, the Black Shoals equation, which is listed below. Um, you can have you have the equation up here, and then all the you know d1 and d2, what what those two constants are. Uh, below and again, this is the price of an option uh, for some stock that's priced at at sub T. Currently, uh, the option expires at time big T. Time big T. Uh, risk free rate is R. Stock monthly buying value is sigma squared. Um, and the strike price, basically, what you have the option to buy the stock at at time big T is, is K. So it's all been discussed previously. In this final video of the series, we're going to try to do some intuition around you know. Obviously, this is a big, nasty uh, formula. Uh, how can we kind of get some intuition into how this works and how will this help us understand stocks and, and call us more? So uh, the kind of chapter that we're doing with this is, or that, that we're kind of like talking about al alongside, coincident is um, linked in the description. Um, basically, we made all these charts. Cool thing about Black Shoal is very easy to code um, and just kind of spit out examples and charts. So. Everything uh, is, is linked in the in the book. You can there's R code to do this yourself and, and that stuff. So we're just going to go over here and talk about it and talk about the intuition. So in the first case, uh, we're gonna we have three charts here. The y-axis for each of them is the option price. And we're going to look at how the option price, which is the result of this formula, how the option price changes as we change some parameters, um, holding all else equal. So the first parameter we're going to change is S sub t, the price of the stock currently. So we want to know how does the option price change as the current price of the stock um, changes. Okay. Uh, so let's say that S sub t goes to infinity. Well, as S sub t goes to infinity, and this is the only one where we can actually kind of look at the terms and, and kind of figure out what happens. As S sub t goes uh, to infinity, what's going to happen to d1? Well, this log of S sub t term is going to get very, very big, right? So this term is going to get big, and that's all that's going to change. So d1 is going to go to infinity. And actually, d2 also, because d2 is basically d1 minus this term, but this term is unchanging if we're just changing S sub t. So both d1 and d2 are going to go to infinity. Okay, right? That makes sense. They're, you know, increasing with S sub t. So what does that mean about phi of d1 and phi of... Well, remember the phi is the CDF of a standard normal uh, distribution. So, you know, if we're thinking about, remember, d1 and d2 are going to infinity, they're all the way out here at infinity. The CDF is everything that's below uh, infinity, which is going to approach 1. So, basically, the density underneath infinity is going to approach 1. So, this is going to be 1, and this term is going to be 1. This term is not going to change, right? K to the ERT. And this term, obviously, S sub t is going to infinity. So the call price is going to go to infinity. And that's intuitive. As the stock becomes like super, super valuable today, if you have a, an option to buy the stock for $10 in 10 days, if the stock is really, really, if the stock is worth $10 million today, your, your call price is, is worth a lot. Because you have the option to buy it at just you know K. And as the stock price goes to infinity, that'll increase. So the actual chart is going to look like this, um, and I kind of drew that how I wanted to, but the idea here is that early on, it's kind of this, this like curved growth. Eventually, it's just going to be linear growth as, as ST gets you know, really big. And that's important to think about. Once ST, like let's say that K equals 10, so the strike is 10, let's say that ST equals a million. You're pretty sure that if ST, if the stock is worth a million dollars, that you're going to end up in the money. Like your stock is probably going to end up over ten dollars, over the strike price of ten dollars, unless there's like some crazy volatility. So once you kind of get to that point, you're pretty sure that you're going to exercise. You're pretty sure they're going to be able to, you know, exercise your option, buy the stock for ten dollars, the strike price. Um, so any change in the stock price is basically just a linear change in how much the option is worth. If it's worth a million dollars, to you know, and then you're going to exercise and the strike price is $10, you're going to get it for a million dollars minus $10. That's the value of the option. If it moves to a million and one dollars, 
your new value is just a million and one dollars minus ten dollars because you're you're pretty sure you're gonna uh, be able to exercise. You're pretty sure the stock's gonna end in the money. So the value of the option is just the price of the stock minus the the price of the strike. It's just gonna the the ending like in the long run that's gonna be the price of your option. It's just the value of the stock minus you know what the strike price is um, adjusted for present value yada yada. But th this is the idea. Early on, obviously, like when the stock price is around the strike price, it's not quite going to be this because there's some probability that the stock ends up below the strike and it might not end up in the money. But once the stock gets super, super huge, you're pretty sure you're going to exercise. Basically, it becomes linear because you're, this is kind of like your, your uh, price of the stock is proportional, which is what that little sign is. Your price of the option is proportional to this value. That's why it becomes linear. Okay, probably, hopefully that, that made sense. Um, the next one we want to talk about is T, so um, time T. T is harder to, uh, or sorry, I want to do T, T minus T, the time to X3. So this is the, the time from now and, and to when it expires. This one is harder to look at, so, you know, D1 looks like it's increasing in T minus T, but it's divided by the square root of T minus T, but this term is bigger, so D1 looks like it's increasing. D2 is a little bit tricky. Uh, you know, this term is obviously decreasing with t minus t, but it's, you know, so it's, it's a little bit trickier. This one, the stock was easier to kind of pick out how it moves, but um, what we can show you is that um, the, and, and the charts are kind of included in the book below, book link below, um, the price of the stock is increasing uh, as t, as the time to expiry increases. And I just drew like a, a line here. We have less that we can kind of interpret about the slope and that stuff. Um, and we talked about this kind of in the very first video in the section. The reason why is because there is limited downside. In the previous video, we talked about how the price of the option is the expected value of the stock minus K, the strike price, but at a minimum of zero. Because if the stock ends up below the strike price, you're just not going to exercise. You're just going to let your option expire worthless. So um, the longer you wait for the option to, like, the longer, you know, if you're, if you have, if the option is, like, a hundred years out, things could go very, very well. The stock could go up a ton in a hundred years. A lot could happen. You can make a ton of money on the upside. On the downside, the worst case is you just make zero dollars or you, you lose what you paid for the option. The longer time uh, goes on, the higher the, the option price, the higher option value, the more time you have. Because again, you have capped downside, unlimited upside. So you just want to kind of have that. Um, you want to you have that. that uh, time in your in your back pocket. One interesting thing to note here is that uh, if you own an option, it's going to get less valuable like the closer you get to expiry because the option, the only thing that's changing about the option is the time until expiry. So you can imagine if you own an option here, tomorrow you have this much time to expiry. The next day you have this much time to expiry. So you by you doing not even like all else, nothing else moves, you know, all else equal the less time until expiry, the less your option's worth. So your option value is gonna decay over time. That's something that we call theta in finance. And it's basically saying, the longer you hold on to your option, the less time there is, so the value is, is gonna decay, which is a bummer. Um, unless you're short the option, which is a whole other thing. So the last example we're gonna give is how much, uh, what, how the option price changes given the underlying vol. Remember, we're assuming that the stock has some underlying volatility, this is given. A lot of ways to estimate this and think about this, but we just kind of assume it's given. It's an input in the model. Um, and we want to think about how the option price will change as the volatility of the stock will change. So it's going to look like this. And here I've, driven, I've uh, drawn the uh, strike price K and the stock price S sub T, the current stock price. Remember, that's not changing, just the underlying vol is. And we can see that, first of all, the... Um, the uh, price is going to increase as vol increases, right? Because again, we have downs. This is kind of analogous to uh, the discussion with the time until expiry. If you're say you you have extreme vol in your stock, if that stock goes up a ton before you expire, it goes up a million bucks. You're going to make a ton of money. But if it goes down to zero, you, you can't. It's not like you can lose a ton of money. You have cap downside. You know, the most you, make, you, the most you make, can make is zero. So because of that uh, unlimited upside, the higher the vol is, the more the stock is worth. What's interesting here is how you can see the value of the option approaches 
the stock price. Um, so, and this is kind of tricky to think about. Um, so let's think about the case when the vol is huge. Let's say it's ten million dollars a day vol. Um, when the when the vol is ten, this is this is a little bit tricky to think through. When the vol is ten million dollars a day, right? The range of outcomes for the stock is so so big. So let's say the vol is is small. It's small. Maybe you know this is the like. Let's say when the vol is small, small. The vol is small. The range of outcomes, say this is your, you know, the number line, it's your possible range of outcomes. Your strike price is here. You know, th this is your, the you're 99% sure that the stock is going to end up here. When the vol is huge, right, your range of outcomes, and here I'm going to stack the glare. Your range of outcomes, K is going to be all the way down here, and, and even more to the left. Your range, basically, your range of outcomes, your range of possible outcomes gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And big, I have to figure out what, yeah, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But your strike price, because there's limited downside, is, is, you know, zero is the, the lower barrier, your strike price just gets smaller and smaller, and smaller like more and more to the left of your, your possible outcomes. So this vol is huge, and you can kind of just look like when the vol is so big, because there's this cap downside and zero is the lowest you can go, it becomes more and more likely that you're going to exercise, that the vol is going to end up, that the stock is going to end up on the right side of K in the money you're going to be able to exercise. So when the vol is massive, eventually this just approaches like you are definitely going to exercise this option. The stock is definitely going to end in the money because the vol is so big, the range of outcomes is so huge, the probability that it ends up like this little small below K is, is small because it could end up from zero to a billion and maybe K is $10. So you're, you're probably going to be you know, in the money. So once you get to that kind of in the money um, value, then your uh, once you, you basically know you're going to be exercising, the value of your option is just the stock because you're going to be able to buy the stock. Um, and you know technically it's I should adjust that, but technically it's the stock you know minus you know the strike price. It's basically the same as this case, but in this case the stock is also stock price is increasing on the x-axis. Here it's not increasing on the x-axis, so that's why we kind of hit that that flat uh, peak. And again, I, I should adjust for the, the strike price you're going to pay. Um, but you kind of get the idea. When the vol is massive, you're probably going to be exercising. Your stock's probably going to end of the money. That basically approaches zero, or approaches one. So since you're definitely going to be exercising, the value of your option is just the stock, because that's what you're going to get, 4K dollars at, at time T. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, again, all these graphs are in the, uh, the book, which is linked below. Um, this whole series, big thanks to Stephen Blyce, Introduction to Quantitative Finance, for helping with a lot of these, these proofs and understandings. Hopefully you enjoyed this, and uh, we will see you uh, next time. So thanks for following along with our Black Shoals derivation. We'll see you soon.